hello, friends. When we last left off, we were talking about magnetism, specifically magnetic fields and how they can be found around bar magnets and the general shape and directionality of them. We also briefly touched upon the subject of what creates magnetic fields. And we arrived at the idea that it was, uh, based on the work of Hans Ersted, electrical currents. And that brings us to our work for today. Magnetism, electric currents, and the relationship between them. Okay, as you can see here, we have an old school CRT television. Old CRT TVs worked by shooting electrons at the screen where the electrons impacted the screen, their electrical energy caused a certain color to be generated and their location determined the picture. But moving electrons are the stuff of electrical currents. Electrical currents generate magnetic fields, but magnets can push and pull on neighboring magnetic fields, which gives us this interesting demonstration similar to how I've shown you in class with the CRT in the corner of my room, a magnet can redirect those electrons as long as they're moving, causing, as you see here, some electrons to be concentrated along magnetic field lines and others to miss the screen entirely, resulting in black areas where there is no picture at all. Why is this? Well, imagine an electron that is not being shot out at a TV screen as being kind of like your finger. If you had your finger sitting completely still in a pool of water. Your finger is there. The water is distorted by the presence of your finger. However, you would get no ripples from this unless you set your finger moving. As you move your finger up and down, you generate little waves, little ripples that move away from your finger. This is similar to the electron. When it's just sitting there, yes, it has an effect on space. That's called the electrical field. But if that uh, electron is moving, then the electric field is distorted. It ripples, it waves, and that distortion is what gives rise to a magnetic field. When an electron or proton or any electrically charged particle moves, a magnetic field is generated. Thus, an electron that is at rest has an electric field because it has charge, but it would not, while at rest, have a magnetic field, and therefore you could wave a magnet at it all day, and it would not be deflected, moved, whatever. An electron in motion would have both an electric field and a magnetic field and would therefore be able to be redirected from its current path by the force from a magnet. Hans Ersted, who we talked about previously, the guy who accidentally, uh, but importantly, discovered that a compass needle is redirected uh, and deflected by the presence of a wire nearby, as long as it is carrying a current. Uh, we've talked about his, his work up to that, but his further experimentation with current carrying wires and their magnetic properties led him to realize that the magnetic field that gets generated by that current, that magnetic field that can be turned on and off on the electromagnetism, 
uh, he found the actual shape and directionality of the magnetic field. If a current carrying wire is surrounded by a sea of compasses, then they will take on this circular pattern in their direction. If the current is then turned off, they snap back to pointing at the Earth's magnetic field. As you can see here, the wire is going up through the page, and the current is also going up through the page. The magnetic field takes on this circular shape as seen by the compass needles. And remember, a compass needle always points from north to south. So there's a north here, south, north, south, north, south, north, south, north, south. If you imagine this as kind of being like wrapped around a bar magnet, then we have a north here deflecting this north, and we would have a south here attracting this north. This leads to what is often referred to as the right hand rule. Now remember that by convention, electrical current is said to go from positive to negative. If we use our thumb in order to illustrate that, then stick the thumb of your right hand up and the current is moving up your thumb from a positive down here to a negative up here, remember, from positive to negative. So your positive terminal of the battery is where your thumb joins the uh, heel of your hand and up through the tip of your thumb is toward the negative terminal of the battery. So your thumb takes the place of the current carrying wire and your fingers curl in the direction of the magnetic field meaning that there's a north at your knuckles and your fingers curling toward your palm puts a south at your palm. Okay, so here we have a current carrying wire. We'll draw it as going up through a table. There's a hole in the table that we have run the wire through. And again, we have a connection to a battery's positive terminal down here below the table and at the ceiling we have the connection to the battery's negative terminal. If like last week's gizmo we were to sprinkle iron filings on this table they should line up maybe you have to tap it a couple times like in the gizmo they should line up along the magnetic field lines giving you this circular pattern. If you were to replace those iron filings with magnets so that you could figure out where the north-south was, redraw. Remember, I is our abbreviation for current still. And make a note so that no one gets confused. By convention, current is from positive to negative. That means that if we are talking about a negative current, like negative charges moving or a stream of electrons, or like in the CRT, uh, an electron that is moving forward, then we would actually be talking about a negative current so if we had this wire with a negative current going through it, it would be from negative to positive. And then instead of our right hand, we would need to use our left hand, our negative hand. There we go. To find the direction of the magnetic field due to a current carrying wire, point the thumb of your right hand along the direction of the current. Your fingers curl 
in the direction north to south of the magnetic field. Now, in order to draw this most accurately, you kind of have to deal with the fact that these are perpendicular to each other. If the current is going straight up along the path of the page, then the circular magnetic field is coming out from behind the wire, behind the plane of the page. It's emerging out, coming above the page to wrap around. The magnetic field around the wire, we typically use a B to indicate the same way we would use an I to indicate a current. So the magnetic field or B field is a 3D thing around the wire, which can get kind of hard to keep track of because we're not typically wired to think about all three dimensions at the same time for space. Uh, and we can really only write in two and we have to do tricks like boldness or something in order to represent uh, the third dimension. Because of this weird uh, 3D problem, we do have a, a notation that makes it a little bit easier to follow. That notation so that you can keep track of drawings that represent into and out of the page. For into the page, I want you to imagine the magnetic field, as we often do with force vectors, as an arrow. But not just like an arrow like this. Imagine a full-on arrow with an arrow head and fletching, that is the feathers on the back that provide flight stability. Let's say that there are four feathers uh, the fletching on the back of the arrow. So if you were looking at it going down into the page, what would you see? You would see those four fletching feathers. So to represent into the page, we do a little X-Men belt buckle. It's supposed to be the fletching on the back of an arrow. So this symbol means into the plane of the page. If something is going out from the page, then it's coming toward you. So what part of the arrow would be heading toward your eye? The tip. So we just draw a little dot to represent the tip of the arrow coming out of the page toward you. This makes it much easier to draw those complex 3D uh, uh, images. So if we had a current in a wire coming out of the page, then our thumb would be sticking up like this and our fingers curl around here. So our magnetic fields would go in this direction in a nice little circle. If we had a current going into the page as opposed to out from the page, we'd stick our thumb down into the paper and our fingers curl around this way. So our magnetic field would be going in the opposite direction. If you want to reverse the current's direction, all you have to do is hook it up to the battery terminals backwards. So if you were to try to recreate Ersted's experiment, if you had a compass sitting next to a wire and it deflected in this direction, and you switched the two terminals on the wire so that it went to the other sides of the battery, you should reverse the magnetic field because you reverse the direction of the current and the compass should be deflected in the other direction. Or, of course, you could, since you reverse the direction of the current, you could use your negative left hand. Positive current coming out of the page curls this way. Negative current coming out of the page curls this way. It works either way. You could either turn your wrist or use your other hand. Whatever feels comfortable for you. Often kids tend to stick with the right hand because for one thing, right hand rule sounds catchy and that's how it's referred to. But also switching back and forth invites confusion. 
All right, so here is a wire running along the plane of the page, or your screen in this case. So the wire is running along the surface of your screen, and here we see uh, vector notation to indicate that above the wire toward the top of the screen, we have magnetic field lines coming into the screen. Below the wire, at the bottom of your screen, we've got magnetic field lines coming out of the screen. Go ahead. You know which way to curl your fingers from the magnetic field notation. At the top, it should be going into the screen, so kind of like that. And then at the bottom, it curls out from the screen. And in which direction does your thumb end up pointing? Well, when you look at it, it'll point to your left. So the direction of current in this wire is this way. So we know that our current is heading in this direction, and we can use the right-hand rule to find that. A worthwhile question is if there is a relationship, which we've just been talking about, between current and magnetic fields, then what happens if you have more or less current? If you hook up more batteries, you should have, from Ohm's law, since there is more voltage, you would have more current. More current will do what to the magnetic field? Well, if you were to venture a guess, it seems pretty reasonable to imagine that if a little bit of current gives you a magnetic field, more current might give you a stronger magnetic field. And of course, that is precisely how it works. We can actually find a numerical relationship for that proportion using an algebra derivation of Ampere's law. Oh, and it's a familiar name. We've been hearing about Ampere for a while. The proportion is simply that if there's more current, there's a stronger magnetic field. Unsurprisingly, the farther you are from the wire carrying the current, the weaker the magnetic field will be at that location. Uh, this is often the case when we've had field strength before, gravity, uh, electric force. The farther you are, the weaker it is. The closer you are, the stronger it is. But here is the equation so that you can find it exactly. The magnetic field, uh, that is the density of the magnetic flux, uh, not that you necessarily need to know it in those terms, can be found using a constant that we call the permeability of free space. What that is, is a measure of how well empty space, a vacuum, lets magnetic field lines form in that space. So really, it's a measurement of how accepting the space in our universe is of the changes that are brought about by magnetic force. If the universe is very favorable, then this should have a really high value. If it lets magnetism very easily go through, if the empty space is averse to having magnetic fields go through it, then this would have a really low value. But permeability of free space times the current through the wire, Notice that these two are both on the tops of their sides of the equation. That gives that a direct proportionality. Inversely proportional is the distance. Now, of course, this distance is affected by the fact that it's in a circle. So as it spreads out, it spreads out in a circle, so your weakening it by the circle. And of course, the area of the circle would be 2 pi r. So we're going to have 2 pi 
times the radial distance from the current carrying wire. It sounds like a long one because we've got so many words to it, but when you write it out, there's actually only three or four things that you'll ever need to plug in with it. Magnetic fields, as I mentioned a moment ago, we typically use B to indicate is equal to permeability of free space, that is lowercase mu, subscript zero. You would read that as mu naught, or mu sub zero if you are a Mortal Kombat fan. But mu naught times current, current would be an I, divided by two pi radial distance away from the wire, or the radius of the circle of the field at that point. So to indicate those on my drawing here, of course, the current is through the wire. This is the magnetic field B, and this distance here is R. So if we plugged all of these in, we could find out how strong the magnetic field B is at a distance R away from a current carrying wire with a current I going through it. And since this exists in our universe as opposed to some other, we must also consider mu naught, which is the permeability of free space. All right, so our magnetic field is measured in Tesla. Tesla, of course, famous for being the name of a car company, but why would you name that car company Tesla in the first place? Well, Nikolai Tesla was a Croatian-American scientist uh, who is very, very well known for just how far ahead of the curve he was at understanding electromagnetism in his time. It's rumored that he may have actually invented a bunch of stuff attributed to other people, but because he never filed for any patents, and because he, he didn't really think too much about monetizing his work, his work was in and of itself its reward. A lot of the stuff that got attributed to other people, Tesla was probably doing a few years before. A lot of people make a very compelling argument that it may have been Tesla instead of uh, Marconi who invented radio. So since he doesn't get as much credit as he probably deserves, we've named a unit after him. This was adopted in 1960 as the accepted unit for uh, magnetic flux density, or if you want to think of it this way, magnetic field strength. Like most of our units that are named after people, when we write it out, we use a lowercase first letter. And if we are abbreviating it, we use a capital of the first letter. So if you're writing out for Tesla of magnetic field strength, you would write for lowercase t Tesla. If you just write it as 4t, then the t should be capitalized. The definition of the Tesla in terms of what is one Tesla is that a particle with a charge of one Coulomb moving at a speed of one meter per second perpendicularly through a one Tesla magnetic field will experience a force pushing on it of one Newton. So the electrons that we saw in the CRT were moving with a speed perpendicular to the magnetic field coming out of that magnet, and they experienced a force that redirected their path. If you use these particular amounts, then you would arrive at 
an example of one Tesla. Of course, this is kind of hard to follow. Uh, so perhaps some practical examples of what a Tesla looks like in terms of uh, experience would be necessary. For some important values that might help give you an understanding of what a Tesla is worth via your experience, here are some examples. Probably the most important magnetic field on the planet is the magnetic field of the planet. So the geomagnetic field, Earth's magnetic field, that's why it's a geomagnetic field. Where are magnetic fields around a magnet always strongest? Exactly, at the poles. So the closer you are to Earth's poles, the stronger the magnetic field is there. For the middle of the hemisphere, where you know, most people are concentrated, uh, for example, in the United States, it's about five times 10 to the negative five Tesla. So reasonably weak, or at least it seems, but then again, you don't see the Earth's magnetic field picking up paper clips and stuff. So it, maybe it's surprising to you that it's a small number, maybe it's not. Uh, if you wanted to write this other ways, this would be four zeros, five Tesla, or you could also rewrite it as 50 micro Tesla. Remember that micro is 10 to the negative six, one millionth. This is the value for the geomagnetic field that we're going to use most often in our problems because that's about what it's worth here in Florida. At the equator, a little bit south of here, actually quite a bit south of here, about 30 degrees or so, but at the equator, you're a little bit farther from the poles. So the magnetic field of the Earth should be a little bit weaker. The equator, it's about 3.2 times 10 to the negative five Tesla. All right, so that's the Earth's magnetic field. You might think, Mr. Stone, other than compasses, what does that do for us? Well, this, while it seems like a small number and, and that seems puny, that is enough magnetic field strength so that the charged plasma coming out of the sun, now remember, charged, like plasma always is, that solar wind, what it is that the sun is so hot and violent that it actually blows out pieces of its own atmosphere, the sun being made of plasma because it's so hot, that plasma blown out toward Earth, moving electric charges coming at us. Well, moving electric charges have a magnetic field, and you can move magnets with magnets. So our magnetic field redirects that stuff away from our atmosphere so that the solar atmosphere that blasts at us doesn't end up heating our atmosphere and eroding it. So while this may seem like a, a minute amount, 50 micro Tesla, what's that? Uh, what good is that? Well, it's good enough to keep us alive because other, <laughs> otherwise it'd be eroding the planet's atmosphere. The ozone layer would be long gone. This is actually what killed off Mars. Mars uh, used to have an atmosphere and with an atmospheric pressure to squeeze water vapor together, it was able to have liquid water on the surface. Now, it's internal magnetic dynamo, that uh, iron liquid layer around its core, is mostly solidified now. Mars cooled off sooner than we did because it's smaller. Without that liquid iron outer core, because it's solidified, well, what happens? You lose your magnetic field other than a few remnants in the surface rocks with no magnetic field to redirect all that solar plasma, your atmosphere gets heated up and eroded and blown away. So Mars has very little atmosphere left at all.
Venus has lost its magnetic field because it's just not moving as fast as it used to. It has a very, very slow rotation. So its magnetic field is also gone because you need motion and charges. Well, it, Mars doesn't have the charges. Venus doesn't have the motion. So Venus lost its magnetic field for different reasons, but it is currently losing its atmosphere. If you have the right angle of view on Venus and you use an ultraviolet telescope so that you can see high energy light, Venus has a freaking comet tail of its atmosphere being blown off and trailing in, away from the sun. Very interesting stuff. But for a more mundane example, a common refrigerator magnet. Unlike the Earth's magnetic field, which can't pick up paper clips where we are, a fridge magnet does. So it's unsurprising that it's gonna be a little bit stronger. About five times 10 to the negative three Tesla, or five millitesla. Did I just write milliliter? Sorry, millitesla. Speaking of the sun, the magnetic fields that cause sunspots, now keep in mind, location matters too, so at the sunspot itself, you get about a third of one Tesla. Are you beginning to realize that one Tesla is probably a really, really large value? And in fact, one Tesla is about what you would expect from a junkyard magnet like in the Brave Little Toaster that picks up cars. If you haven't seen Brave Little Toaster, go watch Brave Little Toaster. But that big junkyard magnet that picks up cars on a crane and then drops them into the compactor to be squished into cubes that's one Tesla. Another thing other than the junkyard magnet as uh, an example of one Tesla is that one Tesla at your brain. So you maybe have like a two Tesla magnet, but it's farther away, or you have a very strong magnet that's sitting on your skull, whatever. If one Tesla, remember distance matters, is at your brain, how do you think? No, literally, how do you think? It's the streams of uh, electrical currents through the nerve cells of your head, right? As those neuron synapses blast stuff at each other, there's motion of charged particles. You're not quite a circuit, but it's close enough. There are electrical currents in your head, and electrical currents can be moved around with magnets. So if you have one Tesla at your brain, it causes confusion and disorientation. There's a, a reasonably famous experiment uh, by some neurologists where they had a one Tesla field at the uh, different people's brains and asked them to look at optical illusions. And as soon as they turned that magnet on, the people had a lot more difficulty keeping track of what it was they were supposed to be looking at. This also explains my next one. Most MRIs, magnetic resonance imagery, uh, or imagers, those are those uh, big tubes that people get put in to check for damage after a head injury or a concussion or whatever. Those big MRIs, which are effectively giant magnets that you get inside of. Well, what's the point of that? Well, exactly what I was just talking about. From the currents in your head and their magnets pushing and pulling on this big magnet, well, this is actually sensitive enough to record those pushes and pulls. And you can use that to map the paths of currents inside of your brain if they work the way they're supposed to. We know what that looks like because we've done enough of these scans for a base of reference. But if you have a damaged portion of your brain, then it may be redirected around it or not moving through it the way we expect. And this allows us to get a picture of that, uh, which is incredible. But 
your average old generation MRIs are one and a half to three Tesla in magnetic strength where the person inside is. This is, eh, you, you don't want to get into one of these if you got a pacemaker. You don't want to get into these if you have steel screws in a, an old broken bone or something. Surgical steel is not magnetic, but regular steel is. Uh, and you sure don't want to have uh, steel like oxygen bottles or a stapler in the room with the MRI machine. Why? Three Tesla. Well, that's enough to turn that oxygen bottle into a deadly projectile as it rushes toward it. There are some fantastic videos on YouTube of people turning on MRI uh, machines and just throwing a stapler at it to see what happens. Well, what happens is that as soon as it hits that magnetic field, it accelerates. Uh, and it's a good way to kill a good 20 minutes of YouTube watching when you're done with this video. But if you've ever had an MRI or you know someone who has, what's the typical reaction that people have when they're in that tube? They freak out. There is a fear response. Even people who are not normally claustrophobic end up bugging out. Uh, that probably has to do with this right here. That one Tesla can kind of disorient and confuse you. Well, newer MRI machines actually have greater uh, field strength. So a brand new, fresh off the line MRI machine right now might be a 10 Tesla MRI. 14 Tesla is the magnets that shoot electrons in particle accelerators like Fermilab. I think it was 2009, someone won an Ig Nobel Prize uh, that is the kind of comedy flavored uh, takeoff of the Nobel Prizes. So science, but weird and funny. Someone won an award for proving this, but with 16 Tesla, you should be able to levitate a frog by pushing and pulling on the water in it. Now water is not strongly magnetic, but it's got charges and it's moving around in you. Uh, so there must be some incredibly weak magnetism from it. Thus, you need an incredibly strong magnetism to generate enough force to lift something off the ground. So if you've got a MRI machine and you have access to it, and you also have access to a frog, if you can get up to 16 Tesla, report back to me. 45 Tesla is the uh, world record for a sustained uh, magnetic field uh, that is 10 times greater than the largest permanent magnet magnetic field strength. So permanent magnet, 4.5 Tesla is the record. Electromagnet, 45 Tesla. 100 Tesla, the magnetic field around white dwarf stars. Now, white dwarf stars uh, have, are stars that are basically killed off by old age. And they're often surrounded by this bubble of gas and plasma that left them, called a planetary nebula. Bruh. That planetary nebula often is concentrated at the poles of the white dwarf because its very strong magnetic field reaches out to that plasma and concentrates it along those magnetic field lines. Bruh often shooting it off from those poles as it accelerates, like the stapler in the MRI machine. Bruh. And again, I want to address the idea of the permeability of free space. Remember I told you if it had a large value, then space loves having magnetism go through it. If it has a small value, it's more like gravity where space doesn't favor it. Well, it turns out the value for the permeability of free space in our universe for magnetic fields 
is four pi times 10 to the negative seven Teslas times meters divided by amperes. And that seems puny, but remember gravity was like 10 to the negative 11 for its constant. So the magnetism constant, mu m for magnetism, uh, smallish. With that, let's do some examples with Ampere's law. Find the magnetic field at a distance of one meter from a long straight wire carrying one ampere of current. This is easy. These numbers are specifically chosen to be easy. So let's take what we're given. We know that we want the magnetic field, B, our radial distance from the wire is one meter. So we're one meter away from the wire. The wire is carrying one ampere of current. And of course, this is a magnetism problem, so we're gonna need mu naught, four pi times 10 to the negative seven Tesla meters per amp. Ampere's law, B equals mu naught I over two pi R. Plug in and solve. B is unknown, so we can't plug in for it. Mu naught is a constant, so it will always have this value. Uh, you don't necessarily need to memorize it, but you'll probably end up using it so much that you'll end up memorizing it. One ampere divided by two pi times one meter. In order to save yourself some time before you try plugging this into your calculator, get rid of like terms. For example, we have an ampere on the bottom, an ampere on the top. Meters on the top, meters on the bottom. Pi on the top, pi on the bottom. Four times one is four, divided by two, is two. So four halves times 10 to the negative seven, two times 10 to the negative seven Tesla. Considerably weaker than the Earth's magnetic field. But again, this is a meter. It's pretty far away from a wire carrying one amp, which is honestly not that much current. So it should be kind of a weak field. Find the current through a long straight wire that would produce a magnetic field twice as strong as Earth's magnetic field at a point five centimeters away from the wire. So we've got our current carrying wire, I, and I is what we wanna know. We've got a magnetic field, B, five centimeters away from it. And we're also given that B is twice as strong as Earth's magnetic field. Well, how strong is Earth's magnetic field? 50 micro Tesla or five times 10 to the negative five. So this thing must be twice as strong. So instead of five times 10 to the negative five, it should be 10 times 10 to the negative five. Tesla. Current is our unknown, and we know mu naught always has the same value. 
one last thing before we start plugging in. Keep in mind, we have this in meters, so this needs to be in meters as well. Five centimeters is 0 0.05 regular meters. Now we can plug in what we've got into Ampere's Law. Bruh. Clever editing there. Let's plug in. Our magnetic field strength is 10 times 10 to the negative 5 Tesla equals 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 Tesla meters per amp. Some amount of current divided by 2 pi 0 0.05 meters. Uh, I did a poor job writing that meters, but that's okay. It's on the top and the bottom, so we can cross it out anyway. Tesla is on both sides of the equation, so we can get rid of that. Pi is on the top and the bottom, so we can get rid of that. 4 divided by 2 is 2. So let's move that 2 to the other side and move the 0.5 to the other side. So 0 0.05 times 10 times 10 to the negative 5 divided by 2 will be our current. Ooh, almost made a mistake there. Do you see what I almost forgot to move? That 10 to the negative 7. That was on the top next to the two, so it should be on the bottom of the other side. That could have gone wrong. Thankfully, it didn't. 0 0.05 times 10 times 10 to the negative 5 divided by 2 times 10 to the negative 7. And thus, in order to get this, we would have to put a impressive, actually, 25 amperes through that wire. One last practice one for you. Let's say that I gave you that there is a 2.6 amp current through a wire 10 centimeters away from some sort of magnetic measuring device. What B field strength would it measure? Well, remember, mu naught is 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 Tesla meters per amp, so we need this to be in meters as well. 10 centimeters is 0.1 zero meters. Just move that decimal two places. Plug in and solve. B equals 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 tesla meters per amp. Times 2.6 amperes. Divided by 2 pi point one zero meters. Save yourself some effort typing and get rid of pi. You could get rid of the two as well and turn this into a two up here. We're going to also get rid of some units. And it should be 2.6 times 2 times 10 to the negative 7 divided by 0.1 Tesla. 2.6 times 2 times 10 to the negative 7 divided by 0.1. We get a B field strength of 5.2 times 10 to the negative 6 Tesla. So about a tenth of the Earth's magnetic field strength. Keep that number in mind for an example we'll do in a moment.
Now, all of these assume that it is a long straight wire where you get that nice circular magnetic field and you get to use the right hand rule and it's just like Ersted found. But not every wire, of course, is a long straight wire. It is possible that you could have the current through a wire that goes in a loop. And if that is the case, well, don't worry, we've got that figured out too. For a single loop, you just use the right hand rule to figure it out, it's easy. Imagine we got a little lantern battery or something. So here's our positive terminal, here's our negative terminal on this battery. We take some stiff wire, kind of make a capital omega shape. There we go. Now imagine and, and think with your hands here, start doing your physics gang signs. Our current goes from positive to negative. So our current at this point right here is going upward. So what does the magnetic field look like there? Well, it would look like this, curling in this direction. So out of the plane of the page on this side into the plane of the page on this side. At the top, our current is going across this way. So we would have it going like this. So it curls in this direction by the right hand rule. And here it'd be going down. So it'd be curling that way by the right hand rule. Trace this around and it actually kind of ends up looking familiar. If you have a complete loop, then you'd also have one here at the bottom where it'd be going that way and curling up here. Think about it. Turn it sideways, might be easier to follow. Here's our loop of wire. Our magnetic fields would be going like this. North here to south here. Below you would have a curling around like this. And other than this gap in the middle, it basically follows a, a bar magnet. You got it coming out of norths that all are over here and coming back to a south that's all over here. So a single loops magnetic field it's kind of like a bar magnet's magnetic field that's spaced out in the middle. If you were to draw the ones for the magnetic field, you see that it follows the same direction. It's just that the shape is a little distorted by the gap in the loop. So single loops, dead easy. Like, that's not a problem at all. Many loops is interesting though. Imagine if we put another loop right here and had the same current going through it in the same direction. Well, this one makes a magnetic field. This one has the same direction and the same current, so the same magnitude of force. They add, so they would reinforce, just like the individual atoms in a domain work together and reinforce and reinforce, and the more there is, the stronger it is. Having multiple loops uh, of wire with a magnetic field are going to make the B field stronger and stronger as you get more and more loops. However, if those loops are kind of spread far apart, that will attenuate it. That'll make it a little bit weaker because remember, distance is always attenuating. A device where you have a, a electricity going through a looped wire like this, 
this has a special name. This is probably the only bit of vocabulary that I need to do for this lesson. This is a solenoid. Solenoid. An electrical device in which a wire is wound into a succession of closely spaced loops. The more closely spaced they are, the stronger it's going to be because you have less distance and uh, you're basically crunching that domain up so that they can reinforce better. These are the heart of pretty much every electrical appliance that does work. For example, an electric fan has one of these wound around a permanent magnet. Magnets can push and pull on each other. So this solenoid wrapped around that magnet pushes on that magnet, causing that magnet to turn, spinning it. Well, if it's spinning, you can mount fan blades to it and you've made an electric fan. Or you could attach a screwdriver bit to the end of it and now you've got an electric drill. A motor is, in, is in and of itself a solenoid wrapped around a magnet. That's it. A solenoid wrapped around a magnet. Magnets repel, thus it spins. And from that simple device, uh, again, invented by, I think, Ampere, we get the basis for pretty much anything that uses electricity to make work happen. Your solenoid, its magnetic field strength B, can be found, of course, it's magnetism in this universe, so what must we include? Mu naught, the permeability of free space. And again, I said this is directly proportional to the number of, of loops in. More loops, stronger. Fewer loops, weaker. But the length of it, that is how far apart those loops are, attenuates it, makes it weaker. And the current through it also uh, is going to be directly related. All right, let's say a solenoid What was that current we used a moment ago? A solenoid is 20 centimeters long, has 200 loops, and carries the same current that we were working with earlier. Find the magnetic field strength inside of the solenoid. Note, inside of the solenoid. Why specifically inside of the solenoid? Why not some radial distance away? Well, notice that we don't have anywhere to plug in the radial distance away. Uh, but more practically, if you draw out that magnetic field, each one of those loops is generating magnetic fields that go inside, as you see here. Outside, they space apart and get weaker. But inside is where they are closest together and therefore stronger. So if you're using a solenoid in order to generate some magnetic fields, it, they're most concentrated in the inside of it, so that's where you put whatever you want to be affected by that magnetic field. Uh, we'll revisit that in a second because there's actually a cool cheat you can do to make it even stronger. So this solenoid, let's say, has 200 loops. It doesn't, but we'll pretend. And it's about 20 centimeters long. It isn't, but we'll pretend. And it's carrying a current. 20 centimeters long is the length of the solenoid. Again, just convert that to base units. Number of loops is 200 loops. Our current is 2.6 amperes. We also need mu naught. Easy, since mu naught always has the same value. That's why we call it a constant. 
and we want the B field strength. Plug in and solve. We have nothing to plug in for B, so we don't. Mu naught is four pi times 10 to the negative seven Tesla meters per amp. Our number of loops is 200 loops. Uh, loops is just a counting number. I guess we don't need a unit for it. Divided by 0.2 meters times 2.6 amperes. Again, this is the same amount of current that we had through the long straight wire where we got about a tenth of the Earth's magnetic field before. 2000 divided by 0.2 is 1000 per meter. 2.6 amps or pi times 10 to the negative seven Tesla meters per amp. 10 to the negative seven times 1000. And you just take these three zeros off of this negative. So it's gonna be four pi times 10 to the negative four meters on the top and bottom, amps on the top and bottom, times 2.6 Tesla. Notice the pi didn't cancel out this time. We didn't have anything to get rid of that pi, so we actually do have to hit the pi button. Four times pi button times 10 to the negative fourth times 2.6. And this time, we got 0.003 Tesla, much closer to a refrigerator magnet. That is, uh, what about, uh, this would be to the negative third power, uh, so about 100 times more powerful than the Earth's magnetic field, but with the same current that used to only give us one hundredth, or excuse me, one tenth of the Earth's magnetic field. So just winding that wire up gave us this huge increase in strength. And it is in this way that we create those super powerful magnets for MRI machines or junkyard electromagnets from the Brave Little Toaster, or even, uh, I don't know, the magnets inside the fan motor in a hair dryer to blow the air out. Solenoids can also be made more powerful by putting an iron or, or magnetizable substance in the solenoid because the magnetic field of the solenoid will align all of the domains in that, uh, in my case, it's a bolt, and now they play along. So you can get a like bonus strength out of a solenoid by uh, putting something inside of it. Here, I'll, I'll give a demonstration for you. We've got a compass that will be responsive to magnetic fields. Here is my solenoid. And I have here, just like Ersted, some alligator clips that will connect to a battery. I don't think he actually had alligator clips, but he definitely connected wire to a battery. Uh, for those of you who are wondering, this is three volts. All right, you can see the north end of the compass. And then I take this, and as soon as I make a connection, we can get a current. All right, you see some deflection there. That north turns this way. If I reverse the wires on here, then it should go around the other direction. So I'll take this negative and put it over here instead. And then when I remake the connection, 
with my alligator clips, notice that it jumps in the opposite direction. Again, stuff that I said earlier, but it never hurts to be shown. Now compare that. Now this is a magnetizable bolt. So you see that it immediately, when brought near the compass, the compass aligns it to itself and you see some jumping of the needle. But let's try a solenoid with stuff in the middle that can be magnetized. There we go. See that so strong sudden jump? Just to prove that there was no trick to it, you see here that the bolt is not a permanent magnet. It doesn't pick up the paper clips. However, you take a battery and let it push a current through that solenoid, and now look. And as soon as the current stops going through the solenoid, the magnetism disappears. Solenoid, a magical electrical device to turn electricity into usable magnetic fields that can be controlled, turned on and off, used to make things spin, whatever you'd like. With this, I think you have enough to hit the ground running on this week's practice sheet. There's also gonna be a gizmo, check Edsby uh, for that. And we'll do another end of the week quiz uh, that'll be open. I don't know, Friday is a holiday in some religious circles. So I will leave it open Friday through Sunday uh, so that you've got a little bit more time instead of just Friday and Saturday. All right, good luck. Don't go fast. Get the easy points. Adios, kids. Bruh.